So we're going to move on from the wrist and <clears throat> talk about the hand. Of course, we've already started talking about the hand and the wrist. But the interesting thing about the hand, um, there's this picture in the book, the motor homunculus, which basically takes the motor cortex of the cerebral cortex. And there we have in our motor cortex, and we'll talk about this way more in neuro, um, what's called a somatotopic representation of body parts, meaning there's a specific part in the brain dedicated to a specific part of the body. The large size of the hand indicates the large proportion of the brain that's dedicated to controlling the hand. So um, you can see in here, like, yeah, the toe, the calf, the knee, they're pretty small. The hand is huge. There's even special areas for each finger. And the face and the mouth are huge. So, um, I mean, I always look at this and I say, this is, this is why we um, took over the whole world, basically, because we have hands that we can use to affect the world around us. So hand function is hugely important for activities of daily living and for just being able to, to do things. Um, so th that's the reason we have this in the book, just to show the importance of the hand and the importance um, of controlling the hand. So um, we the metacarpals, they're designated one through five, um, beginning on the radial side, um, just like the foot. Um, each metacarpal, just like each metatarsal, has a base, a shaft, a head, and a neck. Um, the first metacarpal is the shortest and thickest, so it's very analogous to the metatarsals in the foot. The second uh, metacarpal is usually the longest, and the remaining three bone lengths decrease from radial to ulnar in the medial direction. So, um, with the hand in anatomic position, the thumb's metacarpal is rotated almost 90 degrees medially relative to the other digits. And that's part of our grasping um, capability. The second through the fifth metacarpals are aligned pretty much side by side with the palmar surfaces facing anteriorly. So that saddle joint in the carpometacarpal joint allows that um, 90 degree rotation. So some of the actions in the thumb are just um, rotated 90 degrees from what we would expect them to be. And we'll talk about that. So um, the terminology describing the surface of the carpal bones and finger bones, except the thumb, because it's special, is standard. Palmar surface faces anteriorly, radial surface or dorsal surface faces, um, radial surface faces laterally, dorsal surface faces posteriorly. Um, but with the thumb, the dorsal surface of the thumb faces laterally. So the palmar surface faces medially, the radial surface faces anteriorly, and the ulnar surface faces posteriorly. So the thumb just has to be different. Like I always say, there's a freak in every group. The thumb is it. But the thumb is the reason we rule the world as human beings. <laughs> so um, we can let it be different because it's our power. Um, the hand has 14 phalanges, just like the foot has 14 phalanges. Um, the phalanges within each finger are referred to as proximal, middle, and distal, just like the toes. The thumb only has proximal and distal. Um, except for the differences in sizes, um, all the phalanges which within a particular digit have a similar morphology. So the ones in the pinky finger are going to be the same as the ones in the middle finger. Um, the, the thumb ones, of course, are different because it's the thumb. Just like the foot, it has arches. The hand has arches as well. Um, the proximal transverse arch, and the arches of the hand allow us to grasp things. Um, the proximal transverse arch is formed by the distal row of carpal bones. That's the one that's tightly bound by tendons and ligaments. Um, it's a static, rigid arch that forms the carpal tunnel. And the capitate bone is the keystone of the arch. Um, the longitudinal arch follows the general shape of the second and third rays. Um, the articulations provide longitudinal, longitudinal stability to the hand. So um, each ray um, includes the carpometacarpal joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, and the interphalangeal joints of one um, digit. So the thumb only has one interphalangeal joint, but from the carpometacarpal um, thumb of the joint 
out is the first ray. From the carpal metacarpal joint of the second finger is the second ray. So when we talk about rays, that's what we're talking about. Um, the distal transverse arch of the hand passes through the MCP joints, or your knuckles, if you want to say the metacarpophalangeal joints. The, di the sides of the distal arch are mobile, so that we can wrap our fingers around things. Um, transverse flexibility occurs as the peripheral metacarpals fold towards the central metacarpals. The keystone, keystone formed by the MCP joints of these is um, the central metacarpal. So your, um, our hands are made for grasping. They, they are The arthrology and the configuration of the hands are set up so we can grasp. So um, the finger movements in the cardinal planes, flexion and extension occur, in, and we're not talking about the thumb yet. <laughs> we're just talking about the fingers. Flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. Flexion, we're curling up our fingers. Extension, we're um, lengthening our fingers. Abnabduction occur in the frontal plane. Um, Abnabduction of the fingers is described as motion um, toward or away from the middle finger. So the, the, the third digit, the middle finger, is the um, middle point of the hand. Okay, so any ab or adduction motion, we're using that as our midline. <clears throat> so, um, arthrology for the thumb is a little bit different. Because that thumb is rotated, um, the metacarpal is rotated 90 degrees from the rest of the palm. Flexion is the movement of the palmar surface of the thumb in the frontal plane across and parallel with the palm. So it's um, letter E down there um, on the left. Extension returns the thumb back to anatomic position. So um, remember, in anatomic position, all the joints are in extension. So um, the way I think of it, the way I remember this is when you extend your hand out to shake someone's hand, your um, thumb is in extension. So abduction is forward movement of the thumb away from the palm in the sagittal plane, and adduction returns the palm to the plane of the hand. So thumb terminology, um, thumb motions are rotated 90 degrees from all the other planar motions that we've talked about up until this point. So the thumb is special. Just remember, it's different. It's rotated 90 degrees. So like at the elbow, flexion and extension occur in the sagittal plane. The thumb, it occurs in the frontal plane. At the shoulder, ab and adduction occur in the frontal plane. At the thumb, it occurs in the sagittal plane. So it's 90 degrees rotated from the rest of the body. Interesting, right? We also have special movements in our thumb that we don't have any place else, and special muscles that um, do those movements. So opposition describes the movement of the thumb across the palm, making direct contact with the tips of the fingers. Does that make sense for functional movements? Um, the terminology um, serves as a basis for naming the thumb muscles. So we have the opponent's pollicis and the extensor pollicis longus. So um, those muscles um, are named based on the motions that they do. So um, in terms of the carpometacarpal joints, I think this is a neat picture from the book because it shows some of them are hinge joints, some of them are planar joints, um, one's a saddle joint, so lots of different joints in the carpometacarpal joints. Um, so it's the articulation between the distal row of carpal bones and the bases of the metacarpals. Um, and they're the, in the proximal region of the hand. So the basis for all hand movement starts at the CMC joints at the most proximal region of each ray. The first CMC joint is the most mobile because the thumb is special. The fourth and fifth CM, um, C joints are the next most mobile because they have to wrap around to grasp with the thumb. Um, so the increased mobility of the 4th and 5th CMC joints improves the grasp effectiveness and functional interaction with the opposing thumb. <clears throat> so this guy's holding on to a hammer or something, shovel, some tool. Um, so the carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb is located at the base of the first ray between the metacarpal and the trapezium. So if you remember, the trapezium articulates with the thumb. It's the distal carpal that articulates with the thumb. The proximal carpal that articulates with the trapezium is the scaphoid. 
<clears throat> so the most complex of um, CMC joints, the first CMC joint enables extensive thumb movements. The saddle shape allows the thumb to fully oppose and encircle objects held within the palm. That's the functional significance of that saddle joint. The capsule surrounding the first CMC joint is naturally loose, allowing for a large range of motion. But loose capsule means um, more frequently injured, and that is one of the most common um, arthritic joints in the body. Um, the capsule is strengthened by stronger ligaments and um, muscles, um, but ligament rupture, rupture all, often causes joint dislocation, forming a hump at the base of the thumb. So um, that is a place where people's hands hurt um, when they have arthritis, when because we use our thumbs a lot, we use our CMC joints a lot. Um, the CMC joint is a saddle joint, CMC joint of the thumb. Each articular surface is convex in one dimension and concave in the other, like a saddle. Um, the shape allows for maximum um, combine, combination of stability and mobility. So um, it's powerful. It's a powerful joint. So remember our other saddle joint at the sternoclavicular joint, it's we really want combined mobility and stability. We have to be able to move our arm, but we want stability as well. So that saddle joint, that's its purpose.